Acts chapter 9. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Isabella von Wagnen was born to a Dutch slave owner in 1797, and she was a deeply religious woman. But with all odds against her, she accomplished much for the kingdom of God in her lifetime. The Civil War was probably the most defining moment for her. During her years as a slave, Isabella watched as all of her children were sold to different slave owners. She was the object of severe physical and sexual abuse. After a religious conversion in 1843, she held this mission that she was going to spread the word of God and to speak out against slavery. And so Isabella changed her name to Sojourner Truth. She chose this name because she believed that she was going to travel the land, be an evangelist, and show people their sins. She was also a champion for the Union. She spoke at meetings whenever she was invited. Her grandson, James Caldwell, joined the all-black 54th Massachusetts Infantry. And in 1864, she met President Abraham Lincoln. And she later met Andrew Johnson and Ulysses S. Grant. She became an advocate for women's rights, championed her people, and not only did she become a legend in her own lifetime, but many today consider her to be one of America's founding mothers. In the midst of her suffering, Isabella was transformed from a domestic slave to Sojourner Truth, a hero for every generation to come. And it's an inspirational story. It's a great story, but that was also a long, hard road. In 1962, Victor and Mildred Gortzel published a study of 413 people that they said were famous and exceptionally gifted, and they called it the cradles of eminence. They spent years attempting to understand what produced such greatness in people. What common thread was there that would make people just have outstanding lives? And surprisingly, the most outstanding fact was that virtually all of them, 392, had to overcome some very difficult obstacle to become the person that they were. The Nicene Council, which is the first council ever to have met in Christian church history, several hundred leaders gathered to write the Nicene Creed and to discuss some controversial teachings. Listen to what one historian said about that group. Paul, bishop of Neo Caesarea, had suffered from the frantic rage of Lycanus. He had been deprived of the use of both hands by the application of a red hot iron, by which the nerves which give motion to the muscles had been contracted and rendered dead. Some had had the right eye dug out, others had lost the right arm. Among these, was Pamphanetus of Egypt. In short, the council looked like an assembly army of martyrs. Suffice it to say that struggle and sufferings are part of the Christian life. And there's no greater illustration of this truth than the story we are looking at today in Acts chapter 9. But before we look at the scripture, I would just catch you up on some of the things that have taken place in the book of Acts up to this point. Uh, Saul of Tarsus, commonly uh, known as Paul the Apostle, he's raised as a uh, Jewish man and uh, living in a Roman world, and he's a Pharisee, right? So he understands the Bible. He understands the Old Testament law. But we know him today 
as the Christian evangelist who spreads the teachings of Jesus to the first century. We know him today as the man who wrote 13 books of the Bible. Paul is generally considered to be one of the most important figures of the apostolic age. He also founded several churches in Asia Minor and Europe in the mid-40s and mid-50s. But before all that, remember, he was a Pharisee. He was an enemy of Christ. And the story goes that Saul was on his way to Damascus to harass the followers of Jesus and bring as many of them as he can to jail. But on his way to Damascus, Saul is confronted by a vision of Jesus who blinds him with light and then gives him directions as to what to do next. In verse 10, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. You know, as a Christian, you might often hear this rumor that once you become a Christian, it's all smooth sailing from there, right? Jesus fixes everything. Hey, you got troubles in your life? Come to Jesus. It's like Jesus is a version of Santa Claus, Mr. Rogers, and Will Rogers, <laughs> all rolled into one. But it's so difficult for me to understand where this idea of ease and comfort comes from, because on every single page of the Bible, there is suffering and struggle. Even today, most of us, our goal, right, our life goal would be to eliminate struggle and to create a life of ease. Most of us want to win the lottery so that we can alleviate all the burdens and maybe adopt more creature comforts. And we laugh at the story of the Israelites wandering in the desert, right? Currently on their way to a free country, flowing with food and wealth, and they are currently walking away from slavery and Egypt. And it's a long, hard road. But because the road was long and hard, they moaned and complained. They spoke up to Moses and said, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. God provided food for the people. He met their needs. They're on their way to the promised land. But the people aren't satisfied with living simply. In Numbers, it says they complained because the food wasn't good enough. The people said, we remember the fish we ate for free in Egypt. We also had cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic, but now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. <laughs> because of the hardships and the sufferings of the journey, the Hebrews had convinced themselves that being under a tyrannical ruler like Pharaoh was better than living under the care of the Almighty God. Aren't we strange? We would rather have the routine of tromping mud for Pharaoh than following God into the unknown. And things haven't changed much, have they? The road that God calls us to is still long and hard. So we've already met Paul, 
And now your scriptures have a new character, Ananias. Ananias is an interesting man. The only place we hear of him is when Saul remembers him while testifying before the Jewish people. And this is what Saul says of Ananias. Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. It says that Ananias was a godly man. Saul says that this guy stood by him. But when Jesus appeared to Ananias and told him to go to straight and lay his hands on Saul so that he would receive his sight, Ananias said, no, right? Because evidently Saul has this reputation. The Christians knew who he was and they were aware of what he was doing and they were afraid of him. And you know, I realize that these past lessons and acts have been difficult. There was a lot going on in the early church. It's not like the Gospels. It, because Jesus isn't physically there like he was before, we have all of this kind of human struggling, just trying to figure things out, right? And hearing these past sermons, sometimes it feels like the Bible beats us up sometimes. The Bible steps on our toes sometimes. I mean, here we are, we're already in November, and perhaps a, f a few of you are like me, and you're thinking that, oh my gosh, Christmas came way too early, while others of you are wishing Christmas should hurry up and get here because I just want to be done with Acts. But I'm so thankful for stories like this in the Bible because who hasn't felt God calling them to do something or say something or to be involved in some way, but then we stop and we think about it and we're convinced that God's asking the wrong person, right? We say, God, are you sure <laughs> you got the right phone number? Because like, I, you're talking to me? You want me to do this? I mean, surely God would not ask me to do something that would make me uncomfortable. Doesn't God want me to feel safe? Doesn't God want me to be secure? I mean, after all, I keep praying for a hedge of protection. Listen, you may be afraid to get involved or to take on responsibility. Maybe you don't feel competent to carry it out. But if God is calling you to leave comfort or to leave behind the drudgery of Egypt, get up and go. Isaiah 41 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God will be your capability and confidence when you feel incompetent and afraid. So how does Jesus convince Ananias to go? He says, go for he is the chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. There's two very important lessons that we need to pay special attention to this morning. If we want to come to understand how to successfully navigate this long, hard road of following God. And if we miss these, yeah, the road will wear you out. First, you need to notice that Saul's life was going to be a life of suffering. Jesus says, I'm going to show him how much he will suffer for my name. One modern translation says, don't argue, go. I have picked him as my personal representative to Gentiles and kings and Jews. And now I'm going to show him what he's in for, the hard suffering that goes with this job, which means suffering goes with the job. Suffering goes with the job. I mean, let's be honest for a moment, okay? When you see a commercial on TV, they want to entice you. When you watch a new car commercial, is the car stuck in traffic? <laughs> is the car full of junk with two crying kids in the back? No. You're on the beautiful roads of Maine with the ocean on your left. The car is clean. There's nobody in the car with you. 
They're not selling you a car. They're selling you an emotion. Jeans commercials, beer commercials, they all show the most beautiful people enjoying life. With this product, your life will be better and easier and you'll even be more attractive. This is not the commercial that we get from God. This is not the sell we get from God. This is not his sales pitch. Jesus promises none of that. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, but in this world you will have trouble. The road is long and hard and difficult, by all means. But it still leads to God. We are not wandering aimlessly, which means we have a destination. And if we are destined, then we will arrive. So why is it then that when suffering comes, and it'll come in all kinds of forms and all kinds of fashions, that we just automatically then question, where are you, God? Right? Why has God forsaken me? You know, the devil is attacking me. When the Bible clearly teaches us, not only are these things coming, but they're a part of life. And there's a purpose for them. James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And it doesn't matter what it is. When we suffer persecution, whether it be sickness, poverty, death, turmoil, we too quickly rush to judgment and blame the devil. The Bible never says that. James says, consider it joy when you suffer because it strengthens your relationship with God. King David struggled with his people, struggled with his former king, struggled with his own kids, but God had a purpose. John the Baptist, he knew persecution. God had a purpose. Paul, he had an affliction. Ask God to remove it. God said, hey, when you're weak, I am strong. God had a purpose. Job went from rich to flat broke. Watched many of his family members die. God had a purpose. Mary watched her own son, who never did a single thing wrong, hang on a cross and cry out in agony. God had a purpose. Most of the Psalms were sung in times of difficulty. Most of the letters are written from prison. Most of the greatest thoughts of the greatest thinkers of our day passed through the forges of fire. Florence Nightingale, too ill to move from her bed, reorganized the hospitals of England. She was paralyzed. When trouble comes, stop blaming and instead keep walking the long, hard road. Stephen Hawking was one of the smartest people ever. But as most of you know, he had ALS and it took his life in 2018. He was too weak to write, feed himself, comb his hair, fix his glasses. Everything had to be done for him. At the end of his life, he couldn't even speak. He once wrote, when one's expectations are reduced to zero, one really appreciates everything that one does have. When we come to the conclusion that we are not above suffering and struggle, and when we resign ourselves to the simple truth that we've been given life so that we can bring glory to God and nothing else, only then can we live with purpose. Only then can struggle and suffering be understood for what they are. They are opportunities for us to trust more in the Almighty God, more than we trust in ourselves. When we come to the conclusion that God owes us nothing, but that we are totally dependent on Him, even for our own existence, then we begin to travel the long, hard road. Suffering goes with the job that Jesus hired you for. It's no accident that Saul finds himself in the situation that he's in. Saul was chosen by Jesus, and I've got news for you. You were too. Now, you may ask, well, what difference does it make in how I perceive my struggles? It makes all the difference in the world. If I am simply struggling for struggling's sake, pff, you can have it. 
I don't know about you, but I've never enjoyed struggling. <laughs> I don't enjoy being ill. I don't enjoy being broke. <laughs> I don't enjoy being persecuted or maligned or lied to. I don't really look forward to the aches and pains that come with age. So if I didn't know that I was chosen by God for the struggles I'm going through or that he's going to see me through them, I would throw my hands up and quit. Isaiah 43 says, Now this is what the Lord says, the one who created you, O Jacob, and formed you, O Israel. Don't be afraid, for I will protect you. I call you by name. You are mine. I know that I'm chosen by God. He knows my name. He's got my address memorized. And he's completely active in all of the intimate details of my life. So knowing that, my struggles then take on a whole new meaning. Because he has chosen me, my sufferings and struggles will be used by him to bring glory to his name. And if I continue to serve him, one day I will look back and see the meaning to it. One journalist writing about his retirement said this, Contrary to what might be expected, I look back on experiences that at the time seemed especially desolating and painful with particular satisfaction. Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything I have learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that has truly enhanced and enlightened my experience has been through affliction and not through happiness. So choose right now to be done with that old way of life. Choose right now to forgo an indulgent lifestyle. Choose right now to realize that persecution is a normal part of discipleship for every Christian. Remember that God is working his will in ways we cannot see or appreciate at the time. There's an old hymn that says, Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. As we follow Jesus, we will experience more of the pains, more shame and hardships as we carry our own cross and follow him. Remember our story. Jesus told Ananias that Paul would suffer as a Christian. Well, if you skip ahead in the book, Paul lists out his trials in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received the hands of the Jews, of the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, one frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul endured hardship. So did Jesus, and so will you. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. By complaining or shrinking away from hardships or persecutions or criticisms or calling them the works of the devil, we are in fact nullifying something that God has called us to. Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master. And part of growing into a useful servant is enduring suffering and shame. Because Jesus did. But don't worry. Love is long-suffering. Love has the ability to endure. You know, we mentioned Job earlier. Job said, when I am tired, I will come forth as gold. We need to have that same outlook for all the different stresses that we face. I mean, just look at all the examples of your heroes and your Bible stories for inspiration. The book of Hebrews says others were tortured and refused to be released so that they may gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings, still while others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. You and I will never experience any of that, right? God used those great pioneers to blaze a trail for us to follow. And Allow God then to work in your life regardless of whether you can understand all that's happening. When we look at life 
From a more eternal perspective, it hopefully alleviates that stress and helps us to focus on God's will and not ours. What did Jesus command us to do? Love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you? Jesus says in Matthew, this may be the most difficult commandment in all the Bible. But we got to do it. Jesus prayed for his enemies from the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus knew. But people who persecute, they do it in ignorance. They don't even know they're doing it. So we need to learn to forgive like Jesus forgave. When Ronald Reagan gave his first inaugural address to the crowd, he made these references to the little simple uh, white crosses that mark the graves at Arlington Cemetery. And he says, under one marker lies a man, Martin Treptow, who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with the famed Rainbow Division. There on the Western Front, he was killed trying to carry a message between battalions under heavy artillery fire. We are told that on his body was found a diary, and on the flyleaf under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words, America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost, as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. Martin Treptow had armed himself with the right attitude, so he was ready to give his life for his country. In the same way, you have to arm yourself with the right attitude. You must mentally prepare for suffering. It starts with a choice. Choose the fire over comfort. That is how you are forged. Choose the trial over routine. That is how you will mature. And choose joy, my brothers and sisters, no matter what life throws your way. Let's pray. Lord, suffering is something that each one listening to my voice has had to endure. We have all felt loss, all experienced ridicule, all felt shame, all carry a sense of unworthiness. All have a past we are not proud of. And all struggle with temptation and darkness. May we no longer look up and ask, why me? Because we know that all struggle, all suffer, just as your son suffered and we are not greater than he. Help us to do the hardest thing, to choose joy. Help us to do the hardest thing, to love our enemies and to pray for them. Help us to do the hardest thing, to stay on the road and make progress, no matter how difficult, knowing that there is eternal reward. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and uh, just being with us this morning. Of course, I would just remind you that we're here. We are here in a physical building. There are living, breathing people here that would love to be your friends and to fellowship with you. If you have teenagers or young adults, uh, we've got a youth program from sixth grade all the way through 12th grade. And Pastor Mike would love to uh, teach your kids about the Bible in a relevant way. We've got a children's program from birth all the way up. Miss Teresa would love to have them be in the children's program so that they can learn that Jesus loves them. This I know. Come at 11 o'clock if you have a family, if you want your kids to be plugged in, if you want your kids to learn this same truth. If you're more into traditional church, you like choirs and responsive reading, saying the Lord's Prayer, having communion, then perhaps our 930 service is the one you would like to come to. Comment and find other people that also grew up with church with, in a more traditional sense. 
Walden Community Church wants to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys soon.